Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be doing a video about something I actually find fun and interesting to do, which is repairing old junk that I bought on eBay. Um, I mean, sometimes I buy working junk, and sometimes I buy broken junk, um, especially if I think it's pretty likely to be repairable. And in today, and today's patient is a GTX 570 Direct CU2. Um, it was incredibly cheap. I got it for seven quid. In fact, most of the price was the shipping. Um, and what was even nicer is that the action, the seller actually included replacement MOSFETs um, with it. Because as you can tell from this initial photo, this is the condition that the card came in. So we have a bunch of like flux residue in this area. Also like the fuses up here have been jumped because they obviously like, you know, they're fuses. So when the VRM exploded or well, it didn't explode. There's no crater in the PCB. But when the VR like this phase of the VRM failed, the the fuses popped. So the previous uh well, yeah, the seller tried to repair the you know what, previous owner also works. Yeah, the the they owned the card if they were able to sell it to me, or at least I hope they did. <laughs> anyway, previous owner of the card, uh, you know, they tried to repair it, and so they, they jumped the fuses because the fuses were blown. Um, they were unsuccessful. Apparently, every time they replaced the MOSFETs, they would just die again. And, you know, um, I, I was... So, I my, like, my reaction was basically, oh, I guess they couldn't just find a replacement uh, replacement driver or some something. Um, because the thing is, if you have a MOSFET failure in a VRM that uses discrete MOSFETs, pretty much, well, a lot of the time, you'll have to replace the driver IC. And so I figured that, you know, whoever was selling this card, they just didn't replace the driver IC. And that's why every time they replaced the MOSFETs, uh, the MOSFETs just died again. And so they not only shipped me the card, but they actually sh shipped me appropriate rep like replacement MOSFETs that are exactly the same ones that the card already uses, uh, which is a bunch of PH, I think it's PH7030 ALs uh, from next. Well, for the high side, it's a PH7030 AL from Nexperia, and then a PH5030 AL for the low side. And so there's your two low side MOSFETs, one high side MOSFET. Um, and yeah, and they, they sent along, um, you know, replacement MOSFETs. Um, and so basically, uh, I just needed to dig through my, va like, concerning collection of dead GPUs to find one with the appropriate driver. Uh, and I did find one. It's this uh, MSI 60 thing. I don't, I don't even know what it was at this point, but... Uh, yeah, it's like a, it might be a 560 Ti or a 460 or a 560, some, like, it's a 60 series card. I've had it for ages. When I bought it, the original plan was to turn it into an e-power, but, uh, like, I've looked at this thing, and the PCB on this, the, like, the power plane layout is not ideal for converting it into an e-power. Like, there is lots and lots of, v, like, easily accessible V-Core power plane, and there's, like, no ground. So... Yeah, getting good, getting a good power connection to this VRM if you cut the card would be a nightmare. Um, it's also not that powerful a VRM, but it does use uh, a UPI semiconductor uh, voltage controller. It's roughly from the same time period as this GTX 570, and so you know, I figured, hey, this probably uses the same, like, drivers, um, as this Giga, uh, as this Asus GTX, uh, 570, um, and I was mostly right about that, so the GTX 570, and here you can sort of see me progress, like, partway through the repair, uh, this is, like, it, whoops, this chip right here, that's the, the driver I see. Actually, this is a dual driver, so um, that's why the VRM kind of looks like, oh, we've got, like, doublers and this isn't a real six-phase. But actually, no, it is a real six-phase, and what's going on is each of these chips takes in two PWM signals and then spits out two sets of drive uh, drive signals. Um, so it is a, pr like, proper six-phase. This is just, like, a, a dual driver IC, kind of similar to, a, say, an IR3598. Um, though the 3598 can also function as a doubler. So, like, 3598s, if you see, like, three of them, it's, it's probably not doubling, but if you see four of them, then it actually probably is doubling. Um, but, yeah, these these are not... Uh, I don't know if these are doubler... have a doubling function that's, like, optional. 
Um, I couldn't find any documentation for these, which was kind of annoying. The thing is, there is a very slight difference between the ones on the Asus card and the MSI card. So the ones on the GTX, the GTX 570 here, those are UP6282BD uh, dual drivers. Whereas the ones on the MSI donor card are uh, UP6282AD. So there's that one letter difference. Now, you know, looking at the MSI card, you'll notice that the like passive component arrangement around these drivers is, is quite different, which was a bit concerning because a one letter difference will generally mean that they should be pin compatible. Like it's probably exactly the same chip and there's just like some minor something like i don't know i've not actually like this is probably the first i can't think of any other drivers that have like a one letter difference cuz like i there's a CHL8510 and then there's like oh wait no there's like no but that's like a different name for the same chip like it's not a similar name it's a completely different part number there's like a IR3530 something like that um, cause yeah, Chill got bought out by International Rectifier, and so you can get a CHL8510 in, like, Chill branding, but you can get pretty much the exact same thing in International Rectifier branding ex as well. Actually, I think it's exactly the same thing. They, like, share a data sheet, but anyway, um, yeah, but these, th this, like, you know, one letter difference, and the very different passive component arrangement, I was like, oh, this, that's, um... Interesting. Anyway, I did manage to do some research because while I couldn't find uh, documentation for these UP6282 drivers, I did manage to find pictures of a Asus GTX uh, 560 Ti that uses the same uh, UP6282 AD uh, drivers that the MSI card uses, and the passive component arrangement was the same. So... As far as I, like, at that point, I was like, okay, these are pro almost certainly pin compatible. And, like, the card, you know, so I'll go for it. Um, anyway, so in order to remove the driver, uh, we obviously have to, you know, heat up the area with hot air. Um, and the concern with that, and the whole reason why I removed the two bulk, uh, the bulk capacitors for the input filtering is because these are aluminum polymer capacitors, and while they don't have any liquids inside them, uh, if you get them hot enough, they do have a tendency to just, like, pop right off of the board. Um, very unpleasant. Like, I actually almost got a capacitor to the face that way. Um, so, basically, if we're going to be doing, you know, hot air soldering for this uh, driver over here, and also for just these MOSFETs, uh, these two capacitors kind of need to get out of the way because they are going to get very hot. Um, there's not really, like, they're soldered to, you know, the same power planes as everything else in the area. Like, yeah, th these are, these can't stay. Um, so I desoldered the bulk capacitors, um, which you can see here. And the trick to doing this, um, at least the way I like to do this, is hot air and soldering iron at the same time. Because on a lot of, like, high layer count boards, and the, funnily enough, this GTX 570 is actually not that hard to, to solder on, because, like, the 12-volt power plane, you can kind of see, is not that substantial over here. Um, but yeah, on a, on a lot of boards, if you're trying to, like, pull through whole components, and the board has, like, six layers, and those, power, those components are on, like, a V-core power plane or something, they ain't coming off. <laughs> like, they are gonna fight you very hard because what will happen is you'll try to like heat up the legs of the component and instead you're just going to be heating up the PCB. Um, so the solder will melt at like where the soldering iron is making contact but it won't melt all the way through the through the actual like plated through hole um, and you're just not going to get the get the component out. So what I normally do is I have the hot air set to like 350 degrees celsius and I heat the PCB with the hot air uh, with the hot air at the same time as you know holding the soldering iron up against the legs of the of the of the capacitor and generally uh, and then also I just dangle the board like over the edge so that the capacitor can just fall off um, and that generally works pretty well that's like the best way I've found for removing through hole capacitors because 
like every every other technique that I've tried either ended up in me like pulling the capacitor off with the leads still stuck in the board or with the capacitor getting so hot that it just shot off of the board anyway and the leads were still stuck in the board by the way like the solder didn't like you'll blow the capacitor before the solder melts so through hole capacitors are a kind of a nightmare to desolder in my experience and the best way to deal with well i guess you could just preheat the board to like a crazy te temperature as well but like that's kind of what the hot air is for so um yeah i just go in with both hot air and the soldering iron from the back um so you don't have to worry about actually heating up like the the you know temp like the heat sensitive part of the capacitor because you're just heating up the pc like the back of the pcb and the legs uh, and then generally the capacitor will just kind of fall off thanks to gravity, as as long as it's reasonably heavy. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's how I got the capacitors off. And unfortunately, these, you can kind of tell that they were like, I think there's some flux residue or something that was like holding them in place. They really didn't want to go, uh, which was annoying. Um, but yeah, once you have, once I got the capacitors out of the way, you know, we can just work on removing the uh, dual driver because... We don't have to worry about cooking the capacitors anymore. So, um, next image in the series. Wait a minute. Did I skip over? Did I not take a photo of actually pulling the driver? Oh, wait, no, I did. Okay, so here we go. Um, yeah, so there you can see uh, the driver's been pulled off. It has a rather interesting uh, main pad. Um, yeah, this is, uh, it's not super common that you'll get, like, this kind of cross pattern. Like, yeah, that's it's not that common. Like, I'm guessing they're doing it to make the vias, like, more robust or something. But generally, like, it'll just all be exposed. And what I'm talking about, like, here you can see it on the MSI card. Um, so, yeah, I, I pulled off the, the driver on the MSI card. And you can see the difference in the padding. Like, it's the same same idea. It's just, like... MSI has a lot less solder mask on there, but yeah. Anyway, so pulled the driver um, from both cards, right? Because the driver on the Asus card, we it's probably broken, um, which would explain why the previous owner kept having issues with the MOSFETs failing over and over and over again. Uh, and I, I don't know if they blew up instantly on them, but generally if your driver is bad and you replace the MOSFETs and you turn the card on, they'll just die almost instantly again. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So pulled the, the driver off of the MSI card, pulled the driver on the MSI card. I didn't have to worry about any capacitors because the driver's on the back of the board, not, you know, right next to a polymer capacitor. Um, so I just pulled the driver. Um, and then, is there anything noteworthy? Oh, yeah, I added a little bit of, like, fresh solder to everything, as well as flux. Um, and then just hot-aired the new driver on. I mean, it's not a new driver, it's the, the donated driver, uh, onto the board. Um, and yeah, so, that's not a very good picture, because <laughs> I couldn't hold the camera steady. Have a better picture? Oh, well, you'll, there's later pictures when I have the, the VRM fully rebuilt. So the driver replacement, like, this was actually, like, this is the fiddliest part of this whole operation, because you do have to use hot air for this, and you need to get the capacitors out of the way, and, yeah. So this this was kind of the difficult part. Also, you have the little, you know, capacitors around with, and, yet, like, they, they do, like, they do end up at a temperature where, like, if you nudge them with your tweezers or something, like, yeah, they're gonna go. So you need to be mindful of not, you know, touching things near the, uh, near the, uh, the, the dual driver. And in fact, I think I ended up having to realign these two capacitors because I did end up nudging them. Um, anyway, that wasn't, you know, not too bad. I'm simple enough. And then... Uh, MOSFET replacement, right. So, actually... Oh, I didn't take a picture of, uh... Of... Okay, well... So, the MOSFETs are actually... Like, these MOSFETs are super easy to do. Because you do have that, like, big metal tab for the, like, under pad... Like, the pad that's on the bottom of them. So, I actually managed to get these installed pretty much with just the soldering iron. Also, this PCB is actually not that heavy. 
There's a lot of boards where if you try to, like, you try soldering in, like, the switch node area of the VRM, and it just sucks down so much heat. Like, an absolutely insane amount of heat. Um, and with this board, with the, the JBC soldering iron that I use set to, like, 320 degrees Celsius, um, I could get the entire pad to melt um, by, like, just touching the edge of it, um, which was new that doesn't normally work like you know like i could have the the soldering iron touching like this area of the pad and basically the entire pad would melt so that's how i got the got the mosfets on there and then i just touched them up with the the hot air station with uh didn't yeah di like i didn't have to hot air these on which which was nice because um generally like well so the way i usually do the hot air is that i just hold the hot air over the unpopulated pad until I see the solder melt. Um, and then I put the component on. Because you don't really want to be heating any... Like, y yeah, you generally don't want to be heating up the component uh, for extended periods of time, right? So I normally get the board to the point that the solder is, like, molten and then put the component on rather than, like, holding the component in place and waiting for the solder to melt. Because the component will actually end up shielding the board from the heat and it, it takes even longer and you just end up, like, roasting your MOSFETs and they don't appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so... Anyway, so the MOSFET replacement was nice and easy. Uh, and you can also see that I did end up replacing the, the capacitors with different capacitors because uh, the capacitors that were on the board, like, they didn't really want to, like, yeah, they, they didn't just drop off quite as easily as the as I wanted them to. And so I I didn't feel comfortable with how hot they got in the desoldering process. Um, also, they're probably quite old. So, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really feel like that. I don't have a need to keep using them. I have plenty of spare capacitors. And so I just grabbed a... What did I pull? I think I pulled these off of a dead GTX 980 Ti. Yeah. Um, I pulled these off of a dead GTX 980 Ti. And, you know, they got a new life over here. Um, but obviously, if you saw the previous photo with without the capacitors, you might have noticed, like, wait a minute, there's, there's like, solder in the, the holes. How did you clear that? Well, funnily enough, this board uh, is so light that I actually managed to wick the solder out of the through holes. Um, first time I've ever managed that, ever. Like, probably because usually when I'm desoldering capacity, well, it's not that often that I've actually tried to, like, needed to clear the the holes on, uh, on, like, uh, yeah, like, I've not really, like, I've not, I don't bother with capacitor replacements, right? Like, a lot of people might be like, oh, I want to upgrade the filtering, replace the capacitor. No, just put more capacitors in parallel, because... The thing about polymer capacitors, like, even if you cook them to death, they just end up failing open circuit. As in, they, it, the, the board will behave like those capacitors aren't there. It's not going to, like, you know. So, generally, I don't worry about, like, pulling capacitors and replacing them. But, um, so I don't normally... Yeah, it's not very often that I have to, like, deal with, you know, clearing out the through holes. And also, most of the times that I've actually dealt with, like, you know, replacing capacitors, it's been on, like, eight-layer, like, eight-layer boards, six-layer boards, and not the input side. It's been, like, V-Core. And, you know, the 12-volt power plane here, it's, you know, it's it's got some some mass, but it's nothing compared to the V-Core power plane, right? Um, and so this is the first time ever that I've managed to actually clear through holes with just a solder, like a, a, a solder wick, um, which was quite nice. Because normally the way I have to deal with it is just hot air and then just stick tweezers down <laughs> down the holes because that, like, nothing else... I've, I've tried. I've not managed to get anything else to work because what tends to happen is that you can't get the heat all the way through the board, so the solder deeper down in the in the hole will just not melt, and it won't wick into the, the desoldering braid. So, yeah, like, it, uh, that's kind of that. Um, but, yeah, so this, this really doesn't have very substantial, like, input power planes. Um, 
which is like which I figured out when when this worked because this never works. Like <laughs> first first time I've ever managed to like I've not done like four layer boards. Um, or yeah, like I've never tried to clear the through holes on four layer boards. Um, so that's that's part of it is just like yeah on higher layer counts higher higher power boards like yeah this this doesn't work in my experience normally so um yeah but here it worked which was nice because i didn't have to like the the tweezer thing is is annoying to do um but uh yeah so that that was nice that 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 just kind of worked and then for reinstalling the capacitors like you just put the put them through and then i do again heat up the pcb with the hot air to help the solder wick into the into the actual uh hole properly um cuz yeah if you don't heat up the the board properly the solder like it won't wick into the it won't wick into the hole and you'll basically just get like a big blob of solder on the end of the component leg and it won't be so, like connected to the board properly at all um so like these like this is what you're aiming for. Um, th this right here is actually kind of bad, but I think this might be a case of I put too much solder on there instead of it like blobbing up because it's not going down into the into the hole. But I have like I've seen even some motherboards come from the factory. Actually, this this is like a good example of like not enough like not good um, solder wicking into the hole. Right, like you can see, well, well, you you can kind of see that it's 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 a bit blobby, and it's not supposed to look like that if you do a good job. Um, so yeah, this isn't the worst thing I've ever seen. Like I I have seen motherboards where the, the capacitor literally just isn't soldered to the board. There's just a blob of solder on the leg, and then that's it. Like it, the cap's not actually attached to the board, or maybe it's like attached to the very bottom layer, but it's not properly soldered to through throughout the hole so yeah anyway um yeah replace the capacitors replace the mosfets um here's a sort of final cleaned up photo this is after i actually tested that everything worked um and uh yeah i also replaced the jumped fuses with just a copper plate um which you know, not the best practice. Generally speaking, if you're if you're testing something after you've just replaced VRM components, you should put fuses there, um, to because you know if you screwed up and you don't have a fuse, you could potentially cause a lot of damage. Um, but you know, I was kind of confident that I didn't screw anything up with this, so I didn't bother with putting a fuse on. Um, also, I don't have this style of fuse and. Yeah, I just, I just didn't feel like using fuses on this card, so there. Um, I didn't put a fuse on there, even though, generally speaking, you should use fuses. Okay, like, if you're not sure, use fuses. Worst case scenario, you blow the fuse instead of blowing the board. Um, actually, even if you do use fuses, sometimes it, you'll, you'll still blow the board and the fuse, but... Like, ideally, if you use appropriately sized fuses, the fuse blows before the board does. Um... Anyway, I didn't bother with a fuse, which not, like, you, you know, you, sh you shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily, like, you shouldn't do that until you're certain that everything works. Um, you know, you can have the fuse on there temporarily, for example, if you, if you were being, like, conscious about not having to buy a bunch of extra fuses just because you put them everywhere, but... Anyway, so, yeah, that's, this is what the card looks like after, uh after I tested it and it's fully assembled. We've got the caps installed, the UP6282 AD. You can actually read it in this photo, which I'm kind of surprised by. Um, I wonder if there's one where you can see the BD on the... Actually, I think there was a photo that where you can see the part number on the other ones. I think it's this one. Yeah. Give me a sec. There. So yeah, you can see the BD on the one that I didn't replace um anyway yeah so the 80 parts work just fine so if you have like uh a, i think these have been used on some other boards but basically if you have any gpu with up 6282s uh ad or bd and you have like a mosfet failure 
and you're looking for replacement drivers, you just need to get another GPU that uses 6282 ADs or BDs. You don't need specifically a 6282A or a 6282B. Either seems to work just fine. Um, I don't have documentation to tell you what the difference between them is. There might not, be, there probably, there, is, there isn't much of a difference because this does work. Um, right, and here's proof that it does work. Because that is the GTX 570 uh, running Firestrike. And this is with an overclock and the voltage slider completely maxed out. I mean, I don't think 1125 millivolts is particularly high voltage. But uh, yeah, you know, it, like it's as high as Afterburner goes without me having to jump through any hoops. Uh, by default, the card runs at like... 0.9 something like the Fermi cards run very low voltage uh, by default. Anyway, the heatsink on this thing is great. It runs at 60 degrees Celsius, which is impressive for an air cooler. Um, then again, it is a three slot GPU, so I guess that makes sense. It doesn't seem to be a particularly great overclocker. Um, I mean, right now it's kind of low because I did want Firestrike to just sort of run and run and run and run. Like, it's been running for ages. Um, probably over an hour now. Actually, easily over an hour. But, um, yeah. Let's see when it crashes. So, it'll do 904. 919, okay. 930, neat. 9.42. Oh. Oh, nope, that died. <laughs> anyway, default settings for one of these are 742 core. Because back in the day, manufacturers were scared of shipping GPUs with, like, over 300 watt power limits. <laughs> that That's, like, that's where the overclocking headroom went. It's just like, yeah, um, they, they don't ship 300, like... But back in the day, if you, you if you released a three hundred watt GPU, you know it was it was kind of weird. Um, so GPUs would come with like very low core clocks and low vo like especially well, not all GPUs came with super low voltage, but like one volt is not that high. Um, so yeah. Anyway, this starts out at seven forty two, um, and it can go a bit over nine hundred probably, but. I didn't want to deal with it, like, crashing or anything while running Firestrike, so, yeah, I just had it at 880. Um, and, yeah, so that's the that's the GTX 570 Direct CU2 that I got for, like, 7 quid, and it even came with replacement MOSFETs, which was the best part. Like, I really thought I would have to find, like, some, some replacement MOSFETs. Not that that would really be a problem. I have a bunch of, like, old Fermi GPUs. Um... Actually, I think if I dug through my GPU collection for long enough, I could have probably found, like, better MOSFETs on some, like, with the, with the same footprint. Because th this, like, these MOSFETs look kind of, you know, they, they look a bit fancy, but actually this is a standard, like, power MOSFET footprint, uh, is what it is. Like, um, if we go back to the sort of... Yeah, like, if we go back to this photo, right, like, these MOSFETs that you see on the MSI card, these actually use the exact same footprint as this. Like, it's it's literally this footprint. It's just that, um, well, th this one has some extra, like, notches in it, but, like, you can take these and put them on here. Um, like, that works. Um, and I'm not sure there's any downsides to doing X. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do that. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure you can just do that. Um cuz I've done something like that. This this one has like very distinct pins on both sides, which is kind of surprising. Cuz yeah, like well, some cards basically have the footprint look more like this. Some card cards have it look more like this, I guess, but um yeah, so, like, this, you don't actually even, so, basically, you don't even need to specifically use these MOSFETs. You just need something with, like, similar RDS on, and you also want similar gate, 
uh, characteristics, like similar input capacitance, that kind of thing. Because, um, yeah, if the, if the replacement MOSFETs are significantly slower or significantly harder to drive, then you're going to potentially have, like, uh, switching performance issues, um, which would basically mean that the VRM would run way hotter than it should. Uh, also, if you're doing MOSFET replacements, after you replace the MOSFETs, you should check the switching waveform with the oscilloscope, uh, which you can do by just measuring uh, the switch node of the MOSFETs. Um, so that would be like this tab, or if you're on the back of the card, um, you can just measure this side of the inductors. Um, like this is the output side, right? You can see that's, that's all joined together on one massive like power plane over there. So you want to measure the switch node side of the inductor. Um, and ideally you would do that with the oscilloscope so that you can verify that the waveform looks correct and there's no weird like ringing or something, um, which is a concern. Um, and if you're not sure what the waveform is supposed to look like, like check one of the other phases that is functioning correctly because you didn't repair it, right? Like ideally some of the other phases are still working correctly. So you check one of those and compare it to the one that you replaced. And if they look similar enough, then you're good. If the phase you replaced looks like a horrible mess compared to the other phases on the card, uh, yeah, you probably like screwed something up. Uh, maybe the dri like maybe you cooked the driver, or maybe you mo cooked the MOSFETs. Maybe some passive component is, you know, also needs replacing. That kind of thing. Um, if you don't have an oscilloscope, you still want to, at the very least, check that the phase is actually switching. And you can do that by taking a multimeter to the switch node and just using the frequency mode on a... Well, assuming your multimeter has a frequency mode that goes up to, like, at least 500 kilohertz, um, you can use that to check that the, the, the phase... Like, you won't know if the switching waveform is good, but at least you'll know that there is switching, because if it isn't switching, then you just wasted your time because the MOSFETs aren't actually switching on and off, and they're not working. Um, it's also worth noting that you do... Like, depending on the card, you might have to do that, like, while the card is running some kind of load because there are power saving uh, features built into VRMs to not run all of the phases all of the time, just because running all of the phases all of the time burns slightly more energy. It takes some amount of energy to switch the MOSFETs on and off. So, it, you know, if you're at like idle, running all six phases in a six phase VRM is not necessarily beneficial in any way, shape or form uh, in terms of like energy efficiency. Though, also, the difference in, like, you know, like, this is really more of a concern for laptops than desktop GPUs, so a lot of desktop GPUs just run all of the phases all of the time because it doesn't really matter. Um, but that is something that you could run into where it's like, you know, you turn the card on and you try to check if, if the phases are running and then it'll be like, most of the VRM isn't running because you're at idle. Um, so that that's another thing that sort of, if you're, trying to verify that you successfully replace the MOSFETs and the driver uh, to keep in mind is just like you do you need to actually get the card into like well depending on the VRM implementation you you need to get it out of like idle state um, anyway so yeah this was a really convenient easy fix like the most difficult part was removing the two original capacitors because for some reason they really didn't want to let go of the board. Well, actually, one of them came off easy. The other one didn't. Well, one of them was kind of like, yeah, one, one of them just didn't want to go. Um, anyway. Yeah, so... Um, and basically the main thing to sort of remember from this video is like, if you're going to be replacing MOSFETs because they're dying, um, or if you have a GPU where the MOSFETs failed and you're planning to replace them, you should probably replace the drivers as well, uh, or at least the driver for that, those MOSFETs, you should replace it too, because it is very often, I'm not going to say it's always, because I don't know for sure that it's always, but it is very, very common that if you have failed MOSFETs, the driver for those MOSFETs also failed. Um, so, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, that's it for the, the video. Um, hopefully you found this somewhat interesting. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the com uh, down in the comments section below. If you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon. There's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the AHOC Teespring store where you can pick up shirts, stickers, posters, uh, you know, the usual YouTuber merch, also hoodies. And uh, yeah, so there's like Patreon. And I've also got a band camp um, where I post like industrial noise type stuff um if you'd like to check that out there's a link to link to it down in the description below as well and that's it for the video so thanks for watching and goodbye